Good evening. We are on Saturday the 23rd of July 2022. I'm going to continue with This is the Mass 1958 as celebrated by Bishop Fulton Sheen as described by Henri Daniel Rops from page 31 in that um, wonderful book that um, I borrowed from a priest and uh, this is going to be part three I think I've noted it down in my book as um, part three yes it's going to co contain I am come my lord all heaven as your altar in the name now that and I'm not sure if I'm going further than that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but I, I'm going to begin in a moment. And uh, I'm going to say a one, two, two small prayers. Sorry, that's the folder that it's in. It's squeaking on the glass table. I'll try not to make any more noise if I can help it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here, ever this night be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray, and do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell, Satan, and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. If you've not heard the other two videos, I suggest you hear them before you listen to part three then I don't have to give any explanation. I am come, my Lord, in a ready spirit, armed with hope and with love. I look on this mass as a happy oasis in my life, as a source of refreshment and of vigour so that with a right heart I may resume my work, so that the burdens which oft times I find beyond bearing may be lightened through your loving kindness and your indulgent aid. How many are the hours I spend without a thought of you, my God, forgetful, even of my own soul but in the grip of alien forces keep me mindful of you and of what I am to you for to think of one is to think of the other I pray that these moments which are made holy by being passed in your presence may be a source of faith, of fervour and of joy. Take away from me this bitterness which throttles me, this harsh and agonising dryness which holds me in its grip this darksome discouragement which broods around me, cleanse me from my secret leanings to sin, from inclinations impelling me to choose what is unworthy, from all the evil that I would not and that I yet do. At the very beginning of this Mass, Make me ready to be what you would have me be. 
My trust in you is boundless and my very first word is one of entire confidence in you. I believe in you. In you do I place my trust. It is you alone who are the rock of my being and the fulcrum of my strength. And it is because I am no more in your sight than a reed, a reed which rests in your hands, that I know myself to be strong. Therefore am I glad, glad in my Lord. There awaits me a renewal of my forces in which my soul shall come to full growth by the glad light of this confrontation with you, for which I now make ready, my Lord. I beg you to lead me. Henceforth along the way in which I should go, guide me by truth which is the right hand of your love. All heaven is listening. All the great saints of the past. I am in the presence, not alone of him, before whose gaze nothing lies hid, not alone of that strange and penetrating discernment which belongs to God's angels, but as well in the sight of every man and woman strong enough to have lived by love, of every saint and martyr whose mere existence is a condemnation of my own sinfulness. What shall I, a sinner, now be saying as against me rises the voice of the accuser? The voice that brings me sharply to account the knowledge that I am guilty suffices to stop my own voice. It forbids my attempt at any defence. Against me stand my own actions, which even though human justice might not deem them worthy of reproof, I know to be in some sense wanting or even worse. My secret thoughts rise up from those shoals of wretchedness and dejection which the self-satisfied sloth of human complacency serves but to conceal. And I am faced too with all that I have left undone, with my failures, with my backsliding and strayings, with all the overwhelming burden of my unspoken assents to wrong. I would that the thrice repeated gesture of penitence made upon my breast might bestir my heart and awaken my soul from the torpor of its heavy sleep by recalling me to all that I should do. Now all around me are also the mysterious forces of loving and kindness. All these saints of past times, all the powers of heaven serving as a tribunal of accusation and judgment are become my intercessors before the infinite one. 
the virgin's purity, the martyr's blood. The shining forbearance of the saints are become my safeguard in the mysterious economy of the sharing of merit through the communion of saints. And while the words of absolution resound, I cast aside thought of my fear that I shall fall again tomorrow. And I have to start afresh once more. And I stand upright in joy, regained as suddenly I sense an indescribable relief. Continuing from page 39. As your altar, my Lord, stands in the very heart of this church, visible to all, by being set in that highest place, where spiritual truth rises visible to all, by being set in that highest place, where spiritual truth rises to fitting eminence, grant that in my own heart concern for you may take the highest place in the very core and apex of my being. As this tabernacle shelters your living presence, which with fullest faith I now confess, grant that my soul may learn to know you, whom no man calls to account, and that you may become nearer to me than in my innermost thought, as in this holy table are enclosed the memorials of a cloud of witnesses the holy relics of your saints our pledges of everlasting life grant that I may fully appreciate my place in your church and that my soul may cleave to you in the church as the priest now devoutly bows before your altar, awed by its sacramental glory, grant me to know my own littleness and your greatness. Grant me so to subdue and trample under earthly pride that I may seek and find fulfilment, not in my own poor vanity, but in him who alone endures. Finally, as this kissing of the altar is an avowal and an earnest of that love before which the delights of all earthly loves languish and pale. Grant, Lord Jesus, that I may love you, that I may more fully know you, that I may do only what you will. As I bow, before the secret altar, which is set within my soul. Continuing from page 43, this is the Mass as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, described by Honorary Danielle Rops. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. My Lord, 
grant that I may now make this accustomed gesture as though I were doing it for the first time. Grant that what I know so well as oft times to do rather ill I may now so make as to feel the full joy of its meaning while I sense as it were for the first time the power of the cross. At the beginning of Mass as I approach your sacrifice, let the cross by which I am ransomed be rooted in my heart. Through it may my life and my sufferings be united to your humanity and to the sufferings and to the sorrow which you accepted. May the death which I fearfully await to be joined with that sacrificial death which you willed to meet and to undergo in love. Grant, my Lord, that through this sign which evokes the sanctifying power of the name ineffable, all my hopes and purposes may be guided by the three persons whose names I now invoke, that in the grace of the Son I may be strengthened and guided on my path to the Father, that I may come to him in the truth and by the flame of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. My Lord, as my hand passes from my forehead to my breast and from my shoulder to shoulder. May this holy sign dominate all my thoughts and become all that wretchedness of my heart which to you alone lies open. I may yet know myself to be blessed by you, healed by you, marked with your own seal. Continuing from page 47, this is the Mass, 1958, as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, as described by Henri Daniel Rops. Now that three times the threefold petition has been raised to you, and has come from the depths of the souls of all your creatures throughout all ages as a cry of hope, as a petition for pardon. Now that the angelic choirs and the unforgotten voices of all our brethren in the faith have acclaimed your glory and have given thanks for the name of your glory. Grant, my Lord, that my healed spirit may be established before you in quietude, so that I may enter even into your presence 
and there cry out to you in plain words. My God, I love you. It is you that I worship. My God, show mercy to me. For having said this, I shall have said all. Continuing from page 51, this is the Mass, 1958, as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, described by Henri Daniel Rops. Lord, it is not for myself alone I now do pray. For selfish prayer is scarce a prayer at all. But for all these your people, seen and unseen, for those who bear your blessed sign, for these I pray. Nor do I now forget those others who know you not, or who knowing have forsaken your way. For all we are one in you. With all these then I join in that appointed invocation which your church does place upon our lips today. For each day is given its own singular fashion wherewith to praise you and to pray to you that praying thus, our lasting wish may come to be, and we may grasp that which alone abides. From an undivided heart and in childlike spirit, to all these prayers I do myself unite as your church in due humility, does now pour out in words of plain and forceful sense mankind's fear of oppression, famine, evil deeds and its need of the due of your love. Thus guided by the saints whom we do now recall, be they close or distant, familiar or scarce known, I join the age-long cloud of witnesses in ranks unbroken and unceasing, while with these lips you have given me, I frame the church's prayer and strive to reach the foot of your eternal throne. This is the Mass as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen as described by Henri Daniel Rops from page 52. V11 V's for five and one one, they make it seven. The readings in God's name, the epistle. The Amen, which concludes the collects, bring to its end the first part of the anti-mass to that act of religion called prayer. There now succeeds another act of religion, that of listening to the word. I have a message from the Lord. We are told by the Bible, Judges 3.20, and it is to each one of us that the Lord's word 
is directed. If we would seek the origin of these readings, we would have to delve into the most ancient of Christian usages and to go in fact even beyond them to practices dear to the heart of devout Israel. The service of the synagogue knew such readings from the law and the prophets. Have we not seen Jesus reading Isaiah to his fellow Jews? Luke 4 verse 16 to 21. And did not St. Paul, while on his missionary journeys, take part in similar readings? Acts 13 14, 16. The early church faithfully preserved this usage. Reading from the sacred books bulked large in the primitive liturgies. And it would be surprising to the first Christians were they now to return and hear only the two brief scraps which are left in today's Mass in its epistle and gospel. It's not written here, but they heard it all. In older times, first readings from the Old Testament then some of the apostolic letters and finally a section of the gospel itself were read out for the people to hear and think about. It is this three-part division of preparatory readings which even yet lingers on in the venerable services of Good Fridays. At first, these readings were neither brief nor formally delimited beforehand as they were later made, and the reader used to go on uninterruptedly until the bishop saw fit to signal him that he thought enough had been proposed for the instruction of his hearers. It was only with the appearance of the Roman Missal of 1570 that there came into general usage the two previously selected fragments or pericopes accommodated to the feast being celebrated. The first passage which is ordinarily read is the epistle as this name epistola indicates it is a passage from a letter. On Sundays this apostolic letter is almost always taken from the writings of the Apostle Paul. On other occasions, on saints' days, or on Lenten ferias, and on ember days, it is generally from the prophetic writings of the Old Testament that instruction is proposed to us in the reading, which is then termed Lectio or lesson from whatever its source may happen to be. Evidently, in either case, the liturgical purpose is the same, for it shows that in the beginning God speaks to us by the agency of the intermediaries by the mouth of men who are his witnesses or confessors who are inspired by him to prepare us that we may later receive his own message directly 
and for this reason, the reading is done in the name of the Lord. This is the Mass, page 55, as 1958 celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, as described by Henry Danrell Rops. As at the waters of Babylon, the exiles of Israel were spurred to hope by the voice of your prophets as oppressed Israel found in reading and rereading the books of your law, the most certain guardian of their fidelity to you. As in the beginnings, your church learned from the reading of the apostolic letters of the joy and the love brought us by our Saviour, and as in days of severe trial, your martyrs found in those apostolic words the motive of their self-sacrifice. Grant, my Lord, that these words of your chosen witnesses may find my soul tilled, fertile, and ready to bear Enjoy the fruit of faith. Grant that I may be prepared for that word by which you have spoken to men from the foundation of the world. For it is of the voice of your word, my Lord, that it is written that it brings loneliness to an end and fills the heart with strength. It was that voice which on one harvest day cast your enemy Saul to the ground and with a single word won his heart. Of course, he's talking about Paul. This is the Mass continued from page 56, as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, 1958, as described by Henri Daniel Brops. Now we've reached a V and a 111, which means 8. An interval of preparation between the epistle and the gospel. Between the epistle and the gospel, we find a group of prayers and chants which might readily be taken by the hasty observer to be mere digressions, no more that is to say, then, bypaths leading away from the general plan of the liturgy. But they are actually most meaningful. The reading is brought to a close by the usual formulary expressive of thanks. Dio gratias, thanks be to God words found so often in the Pauline epistles and expressing the notion that we offer thanks because God willed the words that we have just heard to be said or written. It was the custom in the old Israelitish liturgy that the course of the reading or didactic service be broken by the recitation of psalms 
this at once avoided the tedium of monotony and made a certain, a real participation of the congregation in worship. The chants which are found in our missal for the present interval are a survival of this usage. That is, a very old usage among Christians themselves is evident from the testimony of Tertullian in the 3rd century. There are three of these chanted formularies. I'll share them now. The gradual is ordinarily composed of words which appropriately refer back to the lesson just read. And it was anciently begun by a singer standing on the step, gradus of the lectern. To his versicle, the congregation replied by taking up a refrain. The Alleluia is an old Judaic expression of joy and is of immemorial usage. It recalls the Lord's coming and so serves to introduce the gospel. The tract takes the place of the Alleluia on days of penance or in seasons of sorrow. It was designed for the voices of the great solo singers of the past to be sung uninterruptedly by them without the intervention of the choir the people and being set to solemn and noble music it is redolent of antiquity to these formularies the liturgis, lit, liturgists of the middle ages added the sequence or prose a sort of poetic commentary on the feast being celebrated. The words of the sequence were originally set to that long series of melismatic neumes in which the Alleluia seems to prolong itself in bursts of great and continued joy. These proses are most admirable expressions of Christian fervour. Where did it all go? <laughs> Our present missal retains the Victimae Pascali for Easter Day, the Lauda Sion for Corpus Christi, the Veni Sancti Spiritus for Whit Sunday, the Dies Irae for Requiem Masses, that most touching of all, the Stabat Mater, which Jacoponi da Todi wrote in praise of Our Lady in her compassion. There is no doubt that these are adjuncts to the primitive liturgy. But who can be blind to the splendour they lend it? Continuing, this is the Mass from page 59, as celebrated 1958 by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, as described by Andre Daniel Rops. Munda Kaur, cleanse my heart, for your burning coal has more to do than just to make pure these my faithless lips. Hitherto so ready to mouth words of anger or of folly. There are also my ears to be made pure, for they have been over willing to choose the jangling discords of the world above your word. They have welcomed the lie 
more easily than the truth. There are my eyes so slow to open to the light because of their fondness for the things of darkness. There is indeed all my being which waits in need of the purifying fire of your angel. There is my soul, my judgment, my imagination and my simple heart which has betrayed you. Munda core, cleanse my heart. May all my taints and all that is darksome and hateful stains be burnt away and with them all that I know to be foul in me. All that is darksome and hateful to you, grant that your word may stir in me unfailing faithfulness, rousing me to the love that turns not back but ever moves forward into your marvellous, glad light. This is the Mass from page 60, as celebrated by Bishop Fulton Sheen, J. Sheen, 1958, as described by Henri Daniel Rops. 1x, which means 9. The Word of God, the Gospel. We now come to the climax of the Antimas. Up to this point, we have heard the divine message from the lips of men. It is now God himself who speaks to us. Christ comes to teach us by the example of his life and by his own words. And it is for this reason that from the very early days of the primitive church, this reading of the gospel has been considered an essential element in the liturgy. In the catacombs, it was already something that no one ever thought of dispensing with. This high point in the preparation for the sacrifice emphasises the fact that the Christ who came to undergo death for the salvation of each and every one of us is the self same who teaches each and every one of us what to believe and what to do. Therefore, it is that this point in the Mass is marked and surrounded by an especial degree of solemnity. Is not the Gospel book another symbol of the Master? Is not the book which Saint John Christosom said he could never open without a feeling of awe? at chanted masses, incense and lights, and at low masses, the significant gestures of the priest, placing his hand
and at the low masses, the significant gestures of the priest placing his hand upon the book and kissing it and marking it with the cross express the spirit of veneration due to it. Having signed themselves with the cross upon their foreheads, their lips and their breasts, the congregation listen to the reading of the gospel while they stand, those that can, respectively attentive. The signing of themselves triply with the cross is to indicate their intellectual acceptance of truth, their readiness to confess it, and their heartfelt attachment to it. Ever since the 6th century, there has become more and more widespread the present custom of selecting in advance a pericope from one or another of the four Gospels. And the determining idea in this selection has been to offer an embodiment of the particular lesson which the day's mass is to reveal to us. All the other parts of the proper mass formularies are in dependence more or less marked to the gospel pericope. They serve either as commentaries in respect to what has been declared by it or as assurances in respect to the fulfilment of that declaration. This then is a point of culmination. It is the very voice of the incarnate God himself to which we now listen. And when the reading of his word is brought to an end, and the voice of our own faith has been raised to acclaim Christ, our Master and our Teacher. The whole purpose of the sermon which follows lies in principle at least in nothing other than an attempt to develop, to explain, to comment upon the master's words, that in those words our minds may find enlightenment and our hearts enrichment. I'm going to give you a few words from what I shall be doing in uh, part four, because this is part three. I'm only going to do a, sh a short amount. I'm conscious of the time. I have to get up and go to church and read tomorrow morning. <laughs> I hate getting up, but I will. So I'll, I'm going to read. This is the Mass from page 63, as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, 1958, as described by Henry Daniel Lopes. I'm going to read a taster so you'll know what's coming in part four. Uh, I did it with the other one as well. I think it is okay to do that. And then I'll start here at the beginning of part four because I don't know how many parts it's going to. All I know is, is I've got 155 pages typed up. That's not the pages according to what's in the book that I borrowed. 
but the way it's worked out for me because of my eyes I, I the right eye has got the worst cataract and I learned that Wednesday the left one is not so bad so the right one is the worst I'm getting new glasses this week three pairs cool it's ridiculous one for reading one for long sight and one for computer work they took all my uh, extra living help from the government. 320, what was it? 328 pounds. Bar, or was it 29 pounds? Something like that. Bar 20p or something. <laughs> but I've got to look after my eyes. <coughs> so this is from page 63. I'll just give you a taster. Christ speaks to you. Hear him. In these words are the tidings of his life and of his teachings, and they are one. He is the child conceived of the Holy Ghost in a virgin's womb. He is the newborn babe in the manger, destined for lowliness and obscurity. He is the son of a workman and is himself a workman, one who knew how to handle the carpenter's tools. It is he who spoke from the Galilean hills and by the shores of the lake of Tiberias. It is he who healed the centurion's servant, who becalmed the tempest and called Lazarus back to mortal life. He it is who is man's exemplar, the model of perfection, the pattern none can surpass. All this is here. Listen as he speaks. It is he who teaches men to love one another, to pardon enemies and to receive them as brethren to be pure as he was and to be meek and lowly of heart as well. It is he who teaches men to live always in their heavenly Father's sight as he himself did. He it is who alone fully embodies love, truth, justice, the supreme realities which mean more than earthly life. Listen, listen as he speaks and in as much as he was affronted by hatred, by betrayal, by abandonment into the hands of wicked men, in as much as in his human flesh. He suffered more than you can ever suffer, since he died as you shall die. But more horribly, being given over to the dread infamy of a felon's end, therefore did he give you an example to follow by revealing that death is swallowed up in victory for you being ransomed by him are destined and promised to life eternal. Therefore my heart listen as he speaks. I'm going to end it there. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. I've had this book typed up for a very long time and my confessor <laughs> keeps reminding me to get on and and record it so I've set myself a target this week I'm just going to keep going and keep going and so if I don't do all the other normal things you'll know why because I will do little bits but I, I've determined to get this finished and out there because some things don't always get finished immediately and this didn't, I, I didn't like the first two recordings that I did in March. I listened to them before I did these and I said, oh, I better start again. So I started again because the volume wouldn't turn up 
maybe it wasn't I, I have a road recorder I'm not sure whether that was working or not I had problems on the computer and I had to stop the webcam recording because it was too quiet so I've made it so or the help did it made it so that um, it will only take the videos and the road will do the recording because it's an excellent product god bless you all thank you for listening i'm sending you the peace of christ and healing prayers for those who need it may you always be happy and joyful in the lord and i hope you'll stay and hear this book to the end because there's so much beauty in it it's just delightful and then maybe you could do like i do go online and hear um Bishop Fulton Sheen doing a live mass even though the recordings are old it's beautiful okay god bless you thank you i've got to now turn this off